Hi everyone, I'm John DeBerry and welcome back to another installment of Drink What You Want. I'm here today to show you how to make a drink called the Penicillin, which is one of my favorite neoclassical cocktails. But uh, you might notice that my kitchen is a little bit more overrun than usual and you've interrupted me uh, as I'm writing my second cocktail book. So before I show you how to make the Penicillin, I want to give you a little tour of what my life is like right now in terms of like what it, what it means to develop dozens of drinks for a cocktail book. So come poke peek inside. I have my, all my notes, all my recipes, everything here, uh, my insane, you know, Unabomber scribblings. Drinks have to taste good, but they also have to look good uh, in, a, in a book. And my first book was illustrated and I'm planning for my second book to also have illustrations, but even so, I still need to take like a, like a reference photo for the illustrator. So I've set up a little uh, makeshift photo studio here uh, and I have all this paper that I use as a backdrop. I've got a light here. I've also got a ring light over there. My book is about the 90s so I'm trying to like have as much of an aesthetic as possible and I bought uh, one of these reusable cameras. I developed my first roll and the results were not good so I'm sticking to my iPhone <laughs> for now. This sort of like snakeskin background is one of my favorites bottles here and then I have this is my volume bar where I do a lot of like just bang out a lot of drinks. Yeah, exciting times at my house. <laughs> so now that you've seen a bit of the um, control chaos and fun of my past few weeks of my life, I am now going to show you what we are all here to do is make the penicillin, which is one of my, again, one of my favorite cocktails. It has a ginger syrup, which is a bit of work, I will admit, but it is super worth it. It freezes and lasts very long uh, and gives your drinks this just like really, really, really intense ginger kick, punch, uh, whatever you want to call it. The way to produce this ginger syrup, you're going to need about a pound. I, I measured a pound of ginger. Trust me, it is a pound. I'm not faking it for the camera. Then you want to rinse it because you're going to be using the unpeeled ginger. And I know this is kind of a controversial topic. Why would you not peel ginger? Uh, I think the ginger peel gives it this really earthy depth uh, to the syrup. So the way that you make that happen is just give it a little rinse and make sure there's no like gross dirt or anything on the outside. I like to soak it for about 10 minutes and then scrub it with a sponge, like a, like a clean sponge basically. Once you've washed the ginger, you want to get it roughly chopped. You could almost do it just with your hands uh, if you wanted. Uh, if you have ginger, that's a little bit more knobby. Uh, but if you have a big piece, just, just really roughly. You don't need to go too uh, intensely with, with the chopping. You just want to make it easier for the food processor to pulverize it. I'm processing this for a long time, almost to the point of it being like a liquid. You can't really overdo this because ginger is very fibrous and it holds a lot of moisture in those like rough fibers. So the more you can chop them up and make them uh, into nothing, the more easy, easy of a time you'll have getting the liquid out. So you want it like a, like a puree, like almost like a liquid because that's how you'll get the most juice out. This is the fun part for me, sort of, uh, where you basically just like really use your hands to force all of the liquid out. Um, you can get a surprising amount, like ginger kind of it doesn't really feel like it has a lot of moisture in it, but you get, you get a lot. We'll measure once we're done and get the exact yield, and that's important. Yeah, let me know if there's anything uh, you could imagine using uh, dried ginger pulp in. I uh, think like cookies, bread. But for us, we just want the juice because we're making a drink. You get a pretty reliable yield using this method, but I always just like to double check uh, the exact yield. Uh, you'll see it's like a little bit over a cup, which is fine to having a little bit more than you need. But to me, like a, a pound gives you a cup, like roughly. Uh, I'm just gonna pour off a couple ounces so I have just eight even, and then we're ready to go. So careful viewers of, of this channel, of, of, of me, will know that I generally favor non-heat methods of making syrups, but with the case of the ginger syrup, you're using twice as much dry sugar to the liquid, so there's just no way you can get that level of smoothness. It's, it's not gonna dissolve if you don't use heat, so this is the one of the rare times where I do tell you to, uh, to use heat. 
Um, and just want to have a big pot, medium uh, heat, and pour the ginger in. And then you have a cup of ginger, so you want two cups. Uh, you're, use, you're doing this by volume. Um, so I'm a restaurant person, so like my whole life, I've spent like over 10 years working in bars and restaurants, so like I shop out of like restaurant supply stores. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what I use for my containers. These are really useful. And then you might recognize these from like getting takeout. They're actually really useful as well because this is 16 ounces. This is two cups. Quart containers, four cups. So if you don't have like a measuring cup, it's really good uh, as a way to, uh, to measure without uh, on, the, on, on the fly or if you're in like a less than optimal situation. So super useful because here we just have two cups in the pint. I find the best place to go as a New York a New York person is there's all these restaurant supply stores on Bowery, like in Chinatown essentially, and so they have everything you need, all these containers, uh, a lot of the bar tools I got, you know, the things that are very sort of uh, standard issue restaurant stuff. Um, there's a lot of websites, Webstaurant store. You don't want to bring this to a boil because you'll cook the sugar or the ginger and it'll change the flavor, it won't be bad, it'll just be different. And so you just want to carefully monitor it uh, and then I, you know, I, you can put your finger in there it's, if it's not too hot and you can tell if it's still crunchy. So that's the test. It just depends on your individual equipment. I am only now remembering I had like a lot of unpacked trauma from when I was making ginger syrup in a restaurant once and I was like in the middle of service, literally bartending at the same time, like upstairs. Uh, and the whole pot of ginger like boiled over. It like ruined an induction cooktop. Like all the chefs were yelling at me. Um, fortunately, if it boils over at home, the only person I'm mad at is me. Something you can do while you're in the kitchen waiting for the ginger syrup to just uh, dissolve is to prepare the honey syrup, uh, which is just honey and water. You can also juice your lemons at the same time while you're keeping an eye on the ginger syrup. The reason why you want to add, do this to the honey syrup is because honey by itself is very hard to mix with. So if you're just pouring honey directly into your cocktail shaker or your stir or whatever, it's not gonna dissolve, it's just gonna kind of sink to the bottom and be cold and hard and not integrate into the drink. So we, the trick is to add a little bit of water so it's kind of pre-dissolved. Uh, and so you'll see cocktail books and recipes talk about like honey syrup, which sounds kind of like a, you know, like sounds kind of redundant, but it's really important to dissolve it with a little bit of, of water so you can work with it. And uh, with my drinks, what I like to do is two parts honey to one part water. Once the ginger syrup is adequately hot to dissolve all the, all the sugar, it's too hot to work with. You could wait for it to chill, cool off and just like have it in your kitchen or transfer it to a refrigerator uh, and wait a few hours. But another neat trick I learned from working in restaurants is the, the ice bath. And I haven't found any like scientific, like Harold McGee, Dave Arnold style, like verification of why it's a better texture. But when I find that when I use an ice bath to chill a very concentrated sugar syrup, it gives a nice like kind of silky smooth texture. It was explained to me by, by an anonymous chef many years ago that it, uh, the, the, the rapid chilling actually makes uh, sugar crystals uh, less likely to form, so it's less crunchy, so it gives like, like a silkier texture. Making drinks for myself, I would be pouring everything out of containers, uh, <laughs> but I figured why not make it nice for the camera. This drink is truly the gift that keeps on giving because there's just so much at every step that's cool about it. <laughs> no pun intended, but this calls for uh, the big ice cube that I showed you all how to make in my mountainside video. Yeah, from, from last fall. Uh, it's not completely necessary, but it's really nice to have. So a nice big chunk of ice in your old fashioned glass. To, to create the drink itself, uh, you're just pouring a quarter ounce of honey syrup and then a half ounce of the ginger syrup. Three quarter ounces of lemon juice and then two ounces of a neutral blended scotch, something that's not too smoky because that's what you'll be placing over the drink in the form of a spray. Uh, and fun fact, I actually gave away my two ounce jigger a couple years ago and I am too lazy to get another one. So I'm just doing <laughs> two one ounce pours. Uh, so two ounces of that uh, into your shaker, uh, fill with ice. And you 
strain it over. The cube. And then this is the fun part. You have this atomizer that I think is meant mostly for cooking spray, but I like to use it for scotch and to spray over the top. And then last little bit is ginger candy and a lemon wheel. Reason number like 17 why I love this drink is because it demonstrates the kind of unique art form of cocktails and that because we have this spray of smoky, intense, medicinal scotch. So you're like coming to it and it smells like really smoky and it's like Whoa. And then we take a sip and like the ginger and the honey and all that kind of comes into play. So there's this sort of spatial, temporal arrangement that you can do uh, with cocktails that I think is, is sort of a unique selling point of the, the culinary art form. So um, very grateful to this drinks uh, inventor. His name is Sam Ross. He's an Australian guy. He invented this drink in 2005 at the now closed but very iconic uh, speakeasy called Milk and Honey. And it's one of those drinks that feels like it's always been around but it's actually 15, 17 years old. But it's up there for me like among the Sazeracs and the Cosmopolitans and the uh, daiquiris of the world. I highly recommend uh, going through the trouble of making this drink. It's a lot of work, uh, but very well worth it. And uh, speaking of work, I have to get back to uh, <laughs> finishing my cocktail book. So I'm gonna be back in the kitchen and start making a few more drinks. Uh, let me know in the comments if there's any drinks that you wanna see me maybe put in the book. I don't know, maybe it might be too late, but uh, it's always, always fun to hear what you're thinking. So, um, so yeah, uh, give me a shout in the comments. Uh, like, subscribe. Um, tell your friends. Um, see you next month. Bye. I have to have a ring light that you can change the color of. <laughs> this is disco. This is how I, this is just how I live normally. This is just what, so this is just on like all the time.